Today's scripture reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. Hear the word of the Lord. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. Lord, open up your living word and write it on our hearts and minds today so that we can truly follow Jesus as his disciple. Amen. Six days later. So this is, this is happening six days after Jesus has told his disciples that he was going to die at the hand of religious leaders, but then he was going to rise again. And so he takes his disciples, or you know, Peter, James, and John, up on this high mar mountain where he was transfigured, which is the Greek word metamorpho, which is where we get our word metamorphosis. Jesus' appearance was changed. He was somehow changed into another form. And that's startling enough, but his, his clothes became dazzling white. Now, the Gospels of Matthew and Luke record the same thing, that his clothes were um, more, they describe it more like um, were, were, were shining, like there were flashes of lightning coming off of his clothes. And only Mark uses this very strange language of um, saying that they seemed bleached white. As, as the King James uh, Version says, as no fuller could whiten them. And we don't use that term fuller anymore, but other translations refer to this as, as no launder, no one could launder them, no one could bleach them this white. Now this is an, um, always an interesting clue when there's no other word, there's no, this word is not used anywhere else in the entire Bible. And it's uh, nafus. It's um, a nephus is a, is a fuller, is a launderer, is somebody who um, works with cloth and cleans it and whitens it. So you, it always raises, uh, you know, eyebrows. It's like, why did Mark use this word? Why did the other Gospels not mention this particular distinction of this whiteness of Jesus's clothing? Well, one... Um, one commentator, A.B. Canaday, says that Mark likes to allude to the Hebrew scriptures to provoke the reader's imagination to make um, connections between, between texts, between the scriptures. And I believe that's what he's doing here. Because by mentioning this bleaching, um, the, the fuller, the laundry, most people at the time, they would have been, um, you know, Mark's contemporaries would have immediately thought of the Fuller's Field, the Washerman's Field, that was right outside Jerusalem. And it was a place that had a source of water. And so it's a place where people brought their clothes to clean. But that's not what made it famous. It was famous 
as a um, a place in Hebrew scriptures where not not once but twice God sent Isaiah to encounter the kings of Judah as they faced encroaching enemies, and as they were tempted to make a deal with these enemies instead of trusting God. So the first time, um, God sends Isaiah to the fuller's field to um, encourage King Ahaz, because King Ahaz has been paying tribute to um, his enemies and also recognizing their gods. And God tells Isaiah to tell Ahaz to be careful, to keep calm and don't be afraid. And he says, if you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. And this is also the famous place in the book of Isaiah where, where Isaiah tells the king, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. In other words, God's got a plan. Well, there was a second showdown when God sends Isaiah, this time to empower King Ahaz's son, King Hezekiah, who is tempted to make a deal with his encroaching enemies and not to trust God. Hezekiah has done some good things like destroy the high places, but he's also uh, stripped the temple's gold and given it to his enemies to pay them off. But at this point, he's praying in desperation. And so God sends Isaiah to meet him at this fuller's field to, to say, God has heard your prayer. God will defend this city and save it. And sure enough, God sends the angel, his angel of the Lord, to destroy the Assyrian enemies, and um, disaster is averted. So why does Mark do this? It seems like an odd uh, way to tell a story, but it's very effective, because these ideas would be now um, planted in the mind of the listener. Wow, God's been so faithful. Why didn't these leaders trust God? And so it primes us for what is going to happen next when Mark uses Peter as an object lesson in this question. So the, the text tells us, And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, chatting with Jesus. So here comes Peter, who six days earlier both distinguished himself by saying, Jesus is the Messiah, and by disgracing himself when he tries to convince Jesus not to die, causing Jesus to rebuke him, saying, you are setting your mind on divine things. Not on divine things, but on human things, Peter. Because that's what's happening. Peter is setting his mind on human things, and so he devises a plan to build these three dwellings, tabernacles, um, you know, one for Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elijah, so everybody can just stay up there and not, um, not undergo the divine plan, but Peter's plan. And, you know, we'll, we'll never know what was going to happen because I say Peter was saved by the cloud. Um, God's holy presence descends on them, and this voice speaks out saying, this is my son, the beloved, listen to him. In other words, he's saying, listen, you're not staying here, guys. So listen to him and follow him. And whoosh, all of a sudden they're alone with Jesus again. So why does Mark connect these Old Testament stories of God's faithfulness and the people's lack of faith with laundry and with bleach? Well, it appears that the record of scripture is that humanity's chief stain is in not trusting God. And that's been true from the beginning in Genesis to today, that we look to human sources of salvation and not to the divine sources or source. Because Jesus has told Peter six days before that he had to die, and he said, those who lose their life for my sake and the sake of the gospel will save it. But P Peter wants what one commentator calls a theology of glory, not a theology of the cross. He wants his human source of salvation to stay in a spiritual safe space and not to have to follow Jesus down the mountain to 
a really terrible divine source of salvation. It's an interesting scripture for today because after later in the service, we're going to be ordaining and installing our new deacons and elders, our new leaders. And um, it's, a, it's a word of caution for um, any of the leaders of God's people because of this danger of this stain of trusting in our own sources and not in God's. These new deacons and elders are going to renew their baptismal vows and answer some questions that are in the Presbyterian Constitution. They're going to answer this question. Do you trust in the gracious mercy of God, turn from sin, turn to Jesus, and follow him as a disciple? Do you ex accept the Old Testament and New Testament scriptures as God's word to you? And other questions. And then the congregation is going to also be asked to play a part. Do you accept these leaders? Will you pray for them? Will you respect their decisions? Because all of us together bear responsibility for this community. Um, and that was true of the disciples then, and it's true of leaders now. We all have a responsibility to help one another to set our mind on divine things. And this should really humble us, because that's really hard to do. And it's very convenient that we're also starting Lent um, coming, this coming Wednesday. And I hope you'll, you'll come to our Ash Wednesday at 8 p.m. Uh, Ash Wednesday service where we're going to stain ourselves with ashes, where we're going to begin this season of grappling with our mortality and all the stains that we don't recognize. And you might say, well, what stains? Well, stains like pettiness, anger, annoyance, criticism, hurt. You know, we're not talking murder here. We're talking those little stains. But you know, those stains really show up. And so, you know, I'm wearing a white shirt today because I was thinking about if you've ever had a stain on a white shirt and then you put bleach on it, it's, it's almost like a miracle that the stain just goes away. And I think it helps us to understand that this divine plan of salvation is th that God wants us to have a way to deal with the stains that we inevitably accrue because God wants to set us free to love God, to love our neighbor, to love ourselves, to be, to be forgiven, to have all of our stains bleached out, and then to be free to forgive others and to ask God to bleach out their stains. So the, the story goes on. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered his, his disciples not to tell about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Even after this glimpse of glory, divine glory, Jesus knows his disciples don't understand. So why, are they, why should they talk about it at this point? It's after he rises from the dead that they'll understand finally what Jesus has done for all their stains and for the stains of humanity. And that's what Mark is hoping his readers will understand, that Mark's readers will make all these connections and that they'll be willing to go down any mountain with Jesus into a stained and broken world because Jesus has shed a blood that can wash away any sin stain and make the crimson sin, as the Bible says, as white as snow, as white as wool. So that we can sing, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I think Mark wants us to know that the blood of Jesus is some crazy kind of bleach that God has some crazy plan of salvation and that ultimately we serve some crazy kind of God.
Heavenly Father, you do amaze us and sometimes freak us out, just like the disciples were freaked out, because we just don't understand. Help us continue to help one another as your people to set our minds on, not on human things, but on divine things. And continue to bless us and keep us as we enter into the season of Lent. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.